Unit 2 of your general biology course will include an overview of the origins of eukaryotic cells beginning with chapter 25 and then we'll take a little bit closer look at the structure of eukaryotic cells um, as we progress on to uh, the plasma membrane which is primarily covered in chapter 5 and then we will look at the major organelles and structure and function of the major organelles of the eukaryotic cell in chapter 4. So let's start our conversation with looking at the origins of eukaryotic cells. We know there are basically two types of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about prokaryotic cells in the last unit. Now we're going to go ahead and progress on to uh, eukaryotic cells. And uh, just in general, eukaryotic cells are much larger, about 10 times larger than prokaryotic cells. Remember that the defining characteristic that separates prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the presence or absence of a nucleus. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, eukaryotes do. Uh, one of the other major differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that eukaryotes have a kind of a myriad of specialized organelles that are performing specific functions for the cell. And we'll take a look at those organelles a little bit closer as we progress through the unit. Uh, unicellular eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells began to evolve about 1.5 billion years ago. Although the fossil record is starting to push that date back a little bit, and I've seen fossil records uh, that indicate that maybe eukaryotic cells began to evolve as far back as uh, 2 billion years ago. But for our purposes, let's just kind of stay with these uh, big billion year jumps in terms of time periods. And so we've talked about the age of the Earth at 4.5, 4.6 billion years. And then we put the origins of life at about 3.5 billion years. And then the beginning of uh, the conversion of the Earth's atmosphere from a reducing atmosphere to an oxidizing atmosphere, um, primarily as a result from photosynthesis from cyanobacteria, those autotrophic prokaryotes at 2.5 billion years. And so just to kind of keep it uh, a little bit easier for us to remember, let's make this next jump in terms of eukaryotic cells evolving on the planet at 1.5 billion years. Although you might see a little bit of difference in the, those times in your book or in other sources, uh, which would push that date back a little bit further. Multicellular uh, eukaryotic organisms arose about 1 billion years ago. And then we start to see uh, complex communities of photoautotrophic and chemoheterotrophic remember those are terms that come to us from our previous unit, um, start to emerge during uh, this one billion year time period, maybe just a little less one, than one billion years ago. So if you follow this timeline, you can see the origins of uh, eukaryotic cells at about 1.5 billion years, maybe a little bit later. And then as we kind of progress forward, uh, we start to see some primitive uh, multicellular eukaryotic organisms evolving at around 1 billion or just a little less than 1 billion years ago. The thought or kind of theory behind how the eukaryotic cells evolved is called the endosymbiotic theory. And we're going to explore this in a little bit more detail. Uh, but one of the things that we have found out about eukaryotic organisms is that they have genes or sequences of DNA from two different major groups of prokaryotes. And so remember, if you think back to those domains that we talked about, Woozy's three domains, two of those domains are prokaryotes, remember bacteria and archaea. And then the third domain, eukarya, has all of the eukaryotic organisms associated with it. But when we look at the, the gene sequences in eukaryotic organisms, we find that we're really a combination of genes from both of these prokaryotic groups, uh, archaea and bacteria. A lot of the uh, phylogenetic trees will show eukaryotes actually being more closely associated to archaea uh, 
but uh, remember that horizontal gene transfer, kind of that shuffling of genes back and forth between species, probably uh, played a major role in our evolutionary history in terms of all living organisms on the planet. These mixed features uh, really might be a consequence of endosymbiosis. And if you remember that term, symbiosis means the, the living together of two or more organisms. And sometimes that uh, symbiosis can be mutually beneficial for both organisms. And sometimes that uh, symbiotic relationship can be, you know, a plus zero where we talked about commensalism. Or sometimes that relationship can be uh, kind of a plus negative, if you remember those examples of parasitism. So remember in science, uh, we start out from this perspective of trying to explain an observation and uh, come up with an explanation that follows those principles of science. And so in general, we start out with an observation and then we start to ask ourselves some questions, formulate a hypothesis, test that hypothesis, and eventually hopefully arrive at, you know, a better understanding of of, uh, or an explanation of uh, the phenomena we're trying to understand. And so endosymbiosis basically is a, an explanation of the origins of eukaryotic cells. And if you take those two terms and break them down, endo within and symbiosis, again, two or more organisms living together. So I think it's a, a process of endosymbiotic relationships that kind of lead us to this path of the first eukaryotic cells uh, appearing on the planet again at about 1.5 to uh, 2 billion years ago. So let's look at this a little bit closer. Uh, this table gives you a little bit of an idea in terms of why we say that eukaryotic cells are a mixture of uh, genes from these two different sources, uh, these diff two different prokaryotic sources, uh, both bacterial and archaeal prokaryotes. And so just kind of real quickly, you can look and see where uh, the origins of these genes in eukaryotic cells we think um, have evolved from. So DNA replication enzymes, we think those are archaeal. Trans uh, transcription enzymes, archaeal as well. And then as you kind of look down through there, you see a whole bunch of archaea, but every once in a while, bacteria will pop up in there as well. And so, for example, some of the genes associated with mitochondria are uh, genes that we think are more closely related to bacteria than archaea. But all of these genes are rooted in prokaryotes, uh, be it archaea or uh, bacteria. This uh, diagram is one that I think for me really kind of helps you to visualize this process of endosymbiosis. And so kind of keep it simple in terms of what we're talking about. We're trying to come up with an explanation for the origins of eukaryotic cells. And also, you know, you have to have that background knowledge and information of, of uh, what it means to be a prokaryote versus a eukaryote. And so as we look at this diagram, a couple things uh, to keep in mind is, one, we think that eukaryotic cells basically evolved from prokaryotic cells uh, through a process of endosymbiosis. So the endosymbiotic theory basically does a couple of things. One, it provides an explanation for the origins of the nucleus, which we know is the defining organelle of eukaryotic cells. But then one of the other um, really powerful pieces of the endosymbiotic theory is that it, it gives us an explanation for the origins of the energy organelles. And you guys have probably all heard the mito mitochondria. If you don't remember any other organelle, I think probably everybody remembers uh, the mito mitochondria, uh, which is, again, that organelle that we associate with generating energy um, today, primarily through the process of cellular respiration breaking down glucose uh, in the presence of oxygen and generating ATP. The other energy organelle that we find in autotrophic organisms, those organisms capable of doing photosynthesis, um, is the chloroplast. Uh, 
and we think about the chloroplasts, we think about green, the color green, and we associate that with photosynthesis. And that's because of the chlorophyll that's uh, contained within that particular organelle, which allows the, the conversion of solar energy or sunlight uh, using carbon dioxide and water uh, to generate glucose and then oxygen. Remember, oxygen is a byproduct from that photosynthesis. So the endosymbiotic theory proposes that, one, we get the origins of a nucleus through a folding in of the plasma membrane, kind of encircling uh, this genetic information, this DNA, this one ring chromosome that's loose in the cytoplasm uh, as a nucleoid in this ancestral prokaryotic cell. So that's kind of the first part of the endosymbiotic theory is a folding in of the plasma membrane to give us a secondary membrane around the DNA. That's the beginning of the, the formation of the nucleus. And then over time, this evolving eukaryotic cell takes in um, different bacteria, but it doesn't break those bacteria down. Those bacteria become established in a part of this evolving eukaryotic cell. The first bacterium that we think uh, became established as part of this evolving eukaryotic cell through this process would have been a, a, an aerobic bacterium. And the book uses that term aerobic bacterium, but I think what we might be more comfortable with is heterotrophic prokaryotes. So as you follow that diagram, really these two major processes going on, folding into the plasma membrane to form a secondary membrane around the DNA that becomes a nucleus. And then this evolving eukaryotic cell engulfs or takes in a heterotrophic prokaryote, but it doesn't break it down. Um, eventually that heterotrophic prokaryote takes up residence within this evolving eukaryotic cell and becomes established as the mitochondria. Now, if this evolving eukaryotic cell only gets a heterotrophic prokaryote, then it's going to go down one evolutionary pathway that eventually leads to fungi and animals. But some of these evolving eukaryotic cells not only get a heterotrophic prokaryote, but they get an autotrophic prokaryote, for example, a cyanobacteria. If they get both the heterotrophic and autotrophic prokaryote, that takes them down a different evolutionary pathway uh, which eventually leads to algae and then higher plants. So if we have this endosymbiotic theory, we should have some evidence to support it. And so when we look for evidence to support endosymbiosis, we really look to these uh, energy organelles, the mitochondria and the plastids. If you've never heard the word autonomous, <coughs> Autonomous basically means independent. And a lot of times I'll describe the mitochondria and plastids and specifically chloroplasts as being semi-autonomous. It means that basically they could do some of their own functions, almost like at one point they were individually free living cells. And so for example, uh, some of the things that we've looked at in terms of you know, trying to show this relationship to uh, prokaryotic cells uh, with respect to the mitochondria and the plastids, specifically the chloroplast, we see when we look at the mitochondria and the, and the chloroplast that the inner membranes are very similar to the plasma membranes of prokaryotic cells. And so this gives us a little bit of evidence, historical uh, perspective to say, oh, you know, maybe at one point these had been free living prokaryotic cells. The mitochondria and the plastids, again, remember this term autonomous or semi-autonomous, they can do some of these things that we would consider to be uh, cellular functions just as an organelle. And so they can, uh, in a sense, make more of themselves. And so mitochondria and plastids go through a process of division where they can increase the number of mitochondria and or plastids in a way that's similar to cell division that occurs in prokaryotic cells. Remember that binary fission. Uh, the mitochondria and plastids have um, uh, organelles that have their own DNA. And so they have uh, ribosomes and those uh, ribosomes are capable of making some of their own proteins. And uh, when we look at uh, the DNA structure, 
the DNA structure in the mitochondria and the plastids uh, is similar to the DNA that we see uh, basically in prokaryotic cells. And as we had mentioned earlier, in some of these organelles, uh, specifically ribosomes, when we look at the ribosomes in the mitochondria and the plastids that do protein synthesis can make some of the proteins for uh, these specific organelles, those ribosomes are more similar in terms of size and shape uh, to prokaryotic ribosomes than they are to eukaryotic ribosomes. They have what they call ADS ribosomes in eukaryotic cells and 70S ribosomes in prokaryotic cells. And the 70S are a little bit smaller and uh, those are the types of ribosomes that we see associated with the mitochondria and plastids which is again another piece of evidence to support uh, the origins of eukaryotic cells uh, from this endosymbiotic theory where we uh, see an evolving eukaryotic cell engulf or take in heterotrophic prokaryotes and then some uh, not only get the heterotrophic prokaryotes but also the autotrophic prokaryotes and that's really the beginning of this these two different evolutionary pathways uh, that we see leading to the higher organisms today uh, this is a kind of a, a diagram that shows that essentially this uh, endosymbiosis may have occurred more than once and so in some uh, groups of organisms uh, red algae and green algae we see not only um, you know the initial endosymbiotic uh, process of these cells folding in and forming a, a secondary membrane around the DNA the nucleus and then again taking in a heterotrophic prokaryote and then uh, some taking in an autotrophic prokaryote but then this happening again through kind of a secondary endosymbiotic uh, process which can lead to like multiple membranes um, in the plastids in both uh, red and green algae. Don't spend too much time on this. Uh, just know uh, primarily kind of the background and the information on endosymbiotic theory and, and kind of this primary endosymbiosis uh, where we get the formation of the, the nucleus and then the um, energy organelles. Uh, we think the because all eukaryotic cells for the most part have mitochondria uh, we think that the engulfing of a heterotrophic prokaryote probably happened first and becomes established as um, again the mitochondria in these evolving eukaryotic cells and then later because not all eukaryotic cells have plastids or chloroplast some of these evolving eukaryotic cells in addition to the heterotrophic prokaryotes also get the autotrophic prokaryotes for example cyanobacteria uh, taken into the evolving cell and then those become established as uh, the plastids so we're kind of uh, basically talking about this you know 1.5 uh, billion year time period and, and so by this time uh, we've seen an accumulation of oxygen in the earth's atmosphere that would have been a big deal because now you know at uh, 2.5 billion years we start to see that accumulation of oxygen in the earth's atmosphere initially that's uh, probably almost uh, toxic to the majority of the organisms that had been evolving for you know over a billion years in a reducing atmosphere with little or no free oxygen but some of those organisms uh, develop the ability to take advantage of that uh, oxygen and actually become more energy efficient and that leads us down this pathway to higher and higher levels of organization first unicellular eukaryotes at about 1.5 1.8 billion years and then uh, later uh, we see the origins of the first multicellular eukaryotes and so the first uh, multicellular forms were probably colonial forms uh, with little or no differentiation so one of the major things that distinguishes between a a unicellular organism and a multicellular organism is whether you have specialized cells cells that have differentiated for a specific function for the organism it's possible to have groups or clusters or filaments of 
uh, cells together, but if there's no cell differentiation, really those aren't truly multicellular organisms. They're just colonies or filaments of unicellular organisms. Uh, the second wave of diversification occurred basically in multicellularity, um, gave rise to algae, plants, fungi, and uh, animals. The oldest fossil records of multicellular uh, eukaryotes, both kind of these uh, primitive multicellular algaes and uh, colonial flagellates, which we think are really at the, the basis of uh, animal evolution, appear in the fossil record oh, 600 million to 550 million years ago. But the processes probably are, are a little bit older than that that lead to these multicellular eukaryotes and may date back as far as uh, 700 million years ago. This is an example of uh, modern day uh, colonial green algae. And so if you looked at this initially, you might think, well, that looks like a multicellular organism to me. And yeah, I think it's pretty close. Um, the thing that distinguishes it as a colonial uh, algae and kind of more of a, uh, a, just a unicellular colonial organism is it has very little or no uh, cell differentiation or specialized cells. I think it's this process of these individual eukaryotic cells starting to uh, basically come together in these colonies and these filaments that eventually lead us down this pathway to uh, true multicellular organisms once we start to get the cell differentiation. Volvox uh, used to just be described as a kind of a, um, a colonial algae and uh, I think it's you know just fairly recently that they've started to consider Volvox to be more of a, a primitive multicellular uh, organism and due in part I think because they've recognized that there is some cell specialization and so some of the first cells that become specialized if you think about you know the the basic characteristics of life you know what do you have to do at the very kind of you know base level in order to be considered alive uh, would be obviously to acquire nutrients and also reproduce and so Volvox has uh, some cell specialization in terms of cells that are specifically designed primarily to carry out photosynthesis and they also have some specialized cells for uh, reproduction and so Volvox uh, now they're starting to look at as maybe a, a primitive uh, multicellular green algae and there are other algaes, um, red algaes and uh, green algaes primarily that demonstrate some of this uh, primitive level of organization in terms of multicellular uh, level. The origin of multicellular animals. Again, this uh, fossil record uh, pushes back to about 580 uh, million years ago or so. And uh, the idea or the thought about the origins of the first animals is what they call the conoflagellates uh, hypothesis. And when we think about animals, we tend to think about lions and tigers and bears, but uh, again, if you break it down and kind of get to the very uh, basic characteristics of what it means to be an animal, essentially the only thing you have to be to get into the animal kingdom is really three things. Uh, you have to be uh, multicellular. You have to acquire your nutrients from outside sources, which means you're heterotroph, and your cells have to have a membrane-bound nucleus. And so that means that you have eukaryotic cells. So if you have a, if you are a multicellular heterotrophic eukaryote, you get in uh, to the animal kingdom. And we think that the basal animals uh, essentially are, are very similar uh, to these uh, conoflagellates. Uh, conoflagellate is basically what we would consider to be a protozoan proto pre or before zoa animal and so some of these conoflagellates unicellular organisms uh, will congregate into these colonies 
and we think that it's kind of this process that eventually leads us to the uh, to the first animals on the planet some 580 million years ago you wouldn't necessarily think of sponges as being animals but if you uh, look at them as we mentioned earlier they meet the you know that low bar of essentially multicellular heterotrophic eukaryotes which is primarily filter feeders Another group uh, that comes out in this basal uh, kind of lineage of animals are um, the radiate animals, uh, which are primarily the uh, cnidarians, things like jellyfish and corals and, and some of those uh, organisms that we primarily think of as uh, marine organisms. And then later we get uh, bilateral symmetry and some animals that we start to think of that are a little bit more familiar to us. Oh, uh, planarians, flatworms, and and then some of the insects, and then as you kind of move through the uh, the invertebrate phyla, eventually you get to the uh, uh, the vertebrate phyla, whose fossil records date. Uh, I think the first the first vertebrate file, uh, excuse me, the first vertebrate fossils date to. Oh, probably about five hundred and. Uh, 30 million years ago or so and these are uh, primarily fish-like organisms and again this uh, fossil record I think is is being pushed back as we speak there is a very important uh, time in the earth's history and the the history of animal evolution that dates to about 540 million years ago uh, that they call the Cambrian explosion and this was a time when we see basically the animals go through this really rapid diversification and um, it's called adaptive radiation where we see a lot of different groups of animals evolving uh, from about a 10 to 15 million year time period beginning in about uh, 540 million years ago it's called the Cambrian explosion and really the animals most almost all of the animals that we see today uh, were a result from that you know kind of uh, very rapid uh, diversification and evolution of animals during that time period we're going to be moving into a uh, an area of uh, taxonomy really i guess and um, in terms of uh, trying to figure out where all of these eukaryotic organisms kind of fit from an evolutionary perspective. And we've heard that term phylogeny or uh, phylogenetic systematics a couple of times, and that's really where taxonomy is going today. This is a phylogenetic tree uh, that kind of demonstrates really uh, basically four major supergroups of uh, eukaryotic organisms. This is uh, continuously being changed and uh, will always be updated as we gain new information and insight in terms of evolutionary relationships between these different groups of organisms. A lot of uh, the taxonomy is pretty well established in terms of higher level taxonomy for uh, multicellular uh, eukaryotes and so the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, fungi, uh, those groups are, are pretty well established and we'll continue to see some changes at that level. But uh, for the most part, the, the major changes are really coming out of in eukaryotic uh, taxonomy from a lot of these unicellular organisms that historically uh, were in, remember that old uh, kingdom of protista. And so as we take a look at these four uh, eukaryotic supergroups, uh, the, a lot of the, the flux and the changes that are occurring really uh, are a reflection of our trying to understand and, and group these organisms uh, that historically had been placed in that kingdom protista. And so we're going to look at these four major groups of uh, eukaryotic organisms. Uh, there's excavata, SAR, archaeoplastids, and uh, uniconts. And this is just a graphic to show you or illustrate uh, you know, some representative specimens from these major groups. 
one of the things to be aware of, you know, Excavata, uh, we'll talk about first. And then if you take a look at SAR, uh, it's a little bit misleading when they say four eukaryotic supergroups um, because SAR in and of itself is made up of three groups. Uh, those are the stromanopiles, the alveolates, and the rhizarians. And so we say four, but by the time you get done counting, you're going to say, oh, that's not really four. It sounds more like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven if you count SAR as an individual group and then count each of the three uh, subgroups within SAR. So it stacks up into a lot of information relatively quickly. Uh, I put together kind of a little short handout that hopefully will help to uh, summarize these groups and help you uh, to kind of keep things in perspective. So the first of these uh, supergroups uh, is called Excavata. And if you've heard uh, Exca, think like Excavate. And one of the primary characteristics of this group is um, the structure or the shape of the cytoskeleton. And so the one over on the left is, uh, again, this is a unicellular eukaryote. Uh, this one is, happens to be uh, heterotrophic. One of the things that you'll find out about these unicellular eukaryotes that kind of spun out of this group of protista is there's a lot of diversity in them in terms of shape and uh, behavior and feeding strategies. And so um, they're kind of looking at these characteristics in terms of trying to find some natural groupings based on evolutionary relationships. But to excavate kind of means, you know, to dig. And so when we look at a lot of these organisms in this group excavata, it almost looks like one side of the, the cell basically has been hollowed out or dug out. And so that's kind of uh, where that, that group gets its name. If you see the term monophyletic, uh, mono means one. Uh, remember phylogeny or phyletic means evolution. And so monophyletic means that this group shares one evolutionary history. Uh, so this whole group shares a single common ancestor and the goal is to put all of the organisms that have evolved from that uh, single common ancestor into this one group, monophyletic. The group includes uh, diplomonads, parasiblids, and again on this handout you can get a little bit more uh, detailed information about those particular groups. And then there's a really uh, large group uh, called euglenozoans. And this is one that you'll see a lot basically in the biological laboratories. They use it a lot in, in classes, in the lab. Um, they're pretty easy to culture and uh, see underneath the microscope. Um, all of these organisms primarily uh, are aquatic, uh, but think, you know, kind of in terms of broadly in terms of aquatic, they'll also live in like moist terrestrial environments, um, but they, they essentially need some uh, water source uh, to be immersed in or to, you know, continuously keep the, uh, the cell structure wet. Uh, so, so if they dry out too much, then they have problems with osmotic pressure and gas exchange and all that business. Remember that these unicellular organisms are doing all of the life functions in the confines of a single cell. Uh, the euglenozoans, one of the defining characteristics of them uh, is that they have uh, flagella, some of them one, some of them maybe more than one. Um, but the structure of the flagella is this really unusual structure. It's different than what we would see uh, typically in, uh, in the flagella of other eukaryotic cells in terms of it's made up of like a crystalline uh, rod structure and you can see it in cross section in this uh, particular graphic. And so it's that unusual kind of characteristics of the flagella uh, that have been the uh, justification for putting uh, the euglenozoans into uh, one particular group. The other thing about uh, a lot of these protozoans, unfortunately, is that a lot of them are pathogens. And so as you take a look at uh, that review sheet that I had mentioned earlier, um, the eukaryotic supergroups, 
you'll see that a lot of uh, these organisms uh, cause problems in terms of uh, uh, being pathogens and causing diseases. The next uh, supergroup is SAR, and remember that I uh, said, oh, this is one supergroup, but the reality of it is it's really three, and so uh, the S, or the first of the letters of SAR, stands for stromanopiles. Uh, the second one is alveolates, and the third one is rhizarians. And so we'll do kind of a, a quick run through of this group. It's a big group, so I'll try to kind of keep us moving through this section. Uh, but the subgroup stromanopiles, a uh, huge, uh, basically, uh, group within this subgroup are the diatoms. And you can see over to the left, this is an illustration of a diatom. They're just really, to me, unbelievably intricate. These are unicellular organisms. They're uh, an algae, essentially. And being an algae, that means that, uh, you know, they have uh, plastids and they have the capacity to do photosynthesis. You have both marine and freshwater diatoms. They have a uh, hard outer shell. It's called a, a frustule. And it's made out of uh, silicon dioxide. And so each species kind of makes their own unique uh, type of uh, cell wall uh, from the silicon dioxide. So it leaves us with the, the ability to really look at the taxonomy of this particular group, not just today, but from a historical perspective and make some inferences about, you know, what the earth uh, might have looked like, you know, millions of years ago, including even, uh, you know, maybe what the climate was like. And so um, these diatoms play an important role in helping us to understand the history of the planet. But they also are extremely important, accounting for as much as like 40% of photosynthetic activity, especially in some marine environments, which means, you know, photosynthesis, that means oxygen. And so it's, uh, this is a very important group. Uh, here's uh, stromanopiles, and again, here's just a, kind of a graphic of all these really uh, almost look like jewels uh, or jewelry um, in terms of this hard outer outer shell of uh, silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide, SiO2, is basically glass. The next major subgroup from uh, the supergroup SAR is the alveolates. And the alveolates are named for uh, this characteristic of having these like little air sacs uh, just underneath the, the membrane. And so in your lungs, you have these small air sacs for gas exchange called alveoli. And so this is uh, where this particular group gets its name. It's that characteristic of those little uh, air pockets just underneath the, the membrane. Historically, uh, protozoans were grouped uh, primarily based on uh, shape and the presence or absence of a couple of different um, motility organelles, the flagella and the cilia. And uh, now we're looking more at kind of some of these other traits and characteristics and also really trying to emphasize these evolutionary relationships in terms of grouping these organisms. So within alveolates, you have uh, the two major uh, kind of uh, groups are the dinoflagellates, uh, which have uh, flagella and kind of a more traditional arrangement of the flagella in terms of these uh, microtubules and um, microfilaments as opposed to the flagella uh, that we saw in the, the euglenozoans. And then the other uh, major group of organisms are uh, the ciliates. And paramecium, again, is one of these that, that you see a lot, basically, in the labs. They're pretty easy to culture, and you can see them underneath a microscope fairly well. So those are uh, the alveolates. Uh, this is an example uh, of hysteria of a dinoflagellate. Uh, the di dinoflagellates are kind of unique in that they'll have a, a flagella that runs kind of along the long axis of the cell. And then uh, some of them will also have uh, basically a flagella that uh, goes around the equator of the cell kind of in a ring. 
And when both of these flagella are moving, it kind of gives them this uh, forward rolling uh, kind of type of movement that's uh, unique to this uh, group or category of organisms. Fisteria is one, again, as we'd mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of these unicellular uh, eukaryotic organisms that historically had been in that kingdom protista are pathogens. And Fisteria is one that uh, can cause problems, um, intestinal problems, and produce toxins that uh, can make you sick. Mm. Some of these uh, will produce toxins that, then because of uh, specific types of, uh, of pigments that, that these different groups have, uh, sometimes they will actually appear uh, like red in color. And so there is a oh uh, an ecological event that can be very detrimental it's called red tides and so if you get big algal blooms of certain types of uh, especially these dinoflagellates um, they can cause uh, major problems not only just by producing these toxins uh, through metabolic processes but a lot of times you will get uh, you know organisms that are affected by these toxins and dying off and then accumulating basically in systems, marine systems, and even freshwater systems. And then as all that organic material kind of builds up, uh, you get bacteria and other organisms that start to break it down. They pull oxygen uh, out of the water column as they're uh, breaking that organic material down and you can get dissolved oxygen sags and all kinds of things going on associated with, uh, with some of these uh, dinoflagellates and uh, red tides. The last of the kind of subgroups of SAR are the Rhizarians. There's a couple of different groups of amoebas, and amoebas essentially are one of the defining characteristics of the amoebas are what they call pseudopodia. Pseudo means um, false, and um, podia means foot. And so uh, the amoebas uh, move through this kind of unusual process of extending the, the plasma membrane. They'll, they'll push the cytoplasm to one side and generate kind of this, you know, extension of the cytoplasm and either uh, pull themselves to it or they'll use it to kind of encircle, you know, small organisms, other protozoans and bacteria, and then uh, pull those back into the body of the cell to feed on. Um, the rhizarians are amoebas, but a, a common term that you'll see used to describe the rhizarians are shelled amoebas. And uh, so similar to the, uh, the diatoms that we saw earlier, um, the rhizarians will form a, kind of this hard outer shell, which is part of its cell wall. But the shell's not made out of silicon dioxide. I think this particular shell is made out of uh, calcium products. And so a little bit different in terms of the composition of the shell, but uh, they still have this hard outer shell. So the rhizarians uh, have this uh, these thread-like structures called pseudopodia that they will kind of extend through this uh, hard outer shell and uh, helps them basically to capture uh, prey. The formins and saracosins are important members of this uh, particular uh, group or clade. If you see clade, it's again, it's you haven't maybe seen that term before. It's a group of organisms that share a common evolutionary ancestry, and so in a sense, it's, it's similar to uh, phylogenetics or phylogeny. Finally, something that looks halfway familiar, plastids. I know what a plastid is. I know about chloroplast, and I know, you know, plastids are associated with a couple of different groups of organisms that are fairly sim uh, familiar to me. And so when I think of plastids, I tend to think of plants, but I also think of algae. When I think of plastids, I think uh, primarily of chloroplast. But this takes us back uh, to... Uh, conversations that we had earlier in terms of how plastids arose through this endosymbiotic theory and uh, kind of the theory behind the the origins of plastids was that basically these uh, evolving heterotrophic eukaryotic cells uh, took in an autotrophic uh, prokaryotic cell uh, cyanobacteria make that connection autotrophic prokaryotes and cyanobacteria um, 
but again this is related to that endosymbiotic theory and the origins of plastids. So the photosynthetic descendants of uh, these ancient protists, these heterotrophic uh, protists that took in an autotrophic prokaryote basically evolved into uh, the lineages that we see today of our uh, red and green algae. Now, red algae is photosynthetic. It just uses a different uh, wavelength and uh, basically different pigments uh, to perform photosynthesis. And green algae, you know, we're more familiar with and uh, chlorophyll we're more familiar with. When you see those colors, red and green, that's the portion of the light spectrum that those uh, pigments are not absorbing in. That's the portion of the light spectrum that's being reflected back off. Um, and the, the pigments are absorbing in the other, uh, basically, range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so green algae are primarily absorbing um, in the red and blue portion of the light spectrum, and they're reflecting back off uh, the green light. That's why they appear uh, to be green to us. The red algae are absorbing in a different wavelengths of the uh, light spectrum, and so they're absorbing more in uh, probably uh, primarily the blue uh, portion of the light spectrum and reflecting uh, the red, probably absorbing some of the green and uh, violet as well. Land plants are descended from uh, green algae, and uh, so these primitive forms of multi or primitive forms of algae, unicellular, uh, colonial algae. You know, the fossil records date back to 1.5, 1.8 billion years ago, uh, but at about 500 million years ago, uh, we see the first uh, land plants start to evolve from green algae. And the first land plants to evolve uh, are the non-vascular plants, um, the bryophytes and the mosses. And so hornworts and uh, liverworts and mosses are the non-vascular plants. Uh, when you see this uh, supergroup Archaeoplastida, think plastids. If you think plastids, think algae and plants and make that connection. Here's just a couple of examples. If you guys have uh, eaten sushi, uh, a lot of times the rolls, uh, the sushi rolls that you get will be wrapped in a red algae. It's called nori. And then uh, a couple of examples of green algae that, you know, have a little bit maybe higher level of organization and cell specialization, the uh, yulva. And uh, so, Again, uh, algae will uh, kind of skirt that boundary of uh, unicellular. Um, so there's examples of unicellular algaes. There's uh, colonial algaes, and then there's primitive uh, multicellular algaes. So they kind of run the gamut in terms of their levels of organization. The last supergroup is Uniconda, and um, this you can see the basically a uh, a hypothesis, I guess, if you will, of a phylogenetic tree of uh, uniconts. And so over on the far left-hand side, you see this uh, common ancestor. And then uh, each of the branching points represents a, uh, an ancestral point where two groups uh, diverged from that common ancestor. And uh, up at the top, remember that we have four of these eukaryotic supergroups. And so we've talked about three of the four, Excavata, Sar, and Archaeoplastids. Uh, but then up at the top, you have Uniconts. And um, the Uniconts consist of, again, the uh, animals, fungi, and some protists. Uh, two major cl uh, clades, or again, kind of evolutionary groups, uh, groups that share an evolutionary history, are the Amoebozoans and the Pistaconts. Um, animals and fungi, uh, and related protists. This one, uh, I think, is important because it uh, includes us. And so there's a couple of them that are just a little bit more intuitive and I think easier to remember, the archaeoplastids and the, the uniconts. Um, for me, uh, just because they maybe represent higher uh, groups of organisms, plants and animals, 
they're a bit more intuitive in terms of uh, remembering. Mm, don't forget, you know, we have the Rhizarians, which are uh, a type of an amoeba, but they're shelled amoebas. The amoebas that we find in this uh, particular group of Uniconta, uh, these aren't shelled amoebas, and so, uh, and they're really cool. If you you take a look at them underneath the microscope, you can see that cytoplasmic streaming and the formation of the pseudopodia, and kind of the movement of, uh, you know, the gra granular material that's in the cytoplasm. Uh, it's really interesting to watch. Um, but like all of the, some of those others that we referred to as well, uh, there's some parasites and uh, uh, some pathogens in this group, um, especially in the, uh, the amoebas and some of the fungi uh, can give, uh, give other living organisms problems as well. Support for the close relationship between uh, these clades is mixed. And so I think one of the things uh, to remember you know, this kind of grouping of the uh, amoebozoans and the pistachons, um, you know, the jury's still out. And so they will continue to, uh, to basically change uh, their thoughts and their ideas about uh, these, you know, evolutionary relationships and, and grouping of these organisms as time goes by. Uh, just I think we're getting close here. Amoebozoans, this uh, kind of shows you a little bit better graphic of what that pseudopodia looks like as you get the extension of the uh, the cytoplasm and the pushing out of uh, uh, one side of the, the membrane of the cell. And it's uh, called a hyaline cap uh, that kind of is uh, at the tip of that uh, extension of the, the membrane. And um, then um, that term that we'd mentioned before, pseudopodia, pseudo false uh, podia foot. Um, most of these organisms are heterotrophs uh, in terms of the amoebozoans, and they feed primarily on bacteria and other small uh, protists. The epistachons are a diverse group, including animals, fungi, and several other groups of, uh, of protists. There's kind of a, just a summary of some of the, the major groups there. And so there's the, the four eukaryotic supergroups, Excavata, SAR, which we really know is three, Stramanopiles, Alveolites, and Rhizarians, Archaeoplastids should be familiar to us, think primarily just algae and plants, and then Unicons are the amoebas and uh, animals.